Because we live in a sin-marred world and because we are both sinners and sinned against, there will undoubtedly come for each and every one of us times of intense suffering and pain. No matter what family we come from, no matter how much money we have in the bank, no matter how well we plan, and no matter how many Bible verses we have memorized, affliction will still find a way to find us, and life's joys will seemingly be vanquished before our very eyes. This is so true, in fact, that the, authors, uh, the author rather, of Ecclesiastes said that there will come a day, if we live long enough, that we will all cease wanting to live. We will all desire to tap out. And the question that I have for you this morning as we begin to look at the book of Ruth is, When you meet those types of trials, when you meet those types of afflictions, when you are stuck in the mud and the mire, as it were, and if you haven't, you will remember that, what do you think about? What types of questions are you asking yourself and others in an attempt to rationalize the disorienting situation that you have found yourself in? Well, my guess would be if you have flesh like me, you might wind up asking these types of questions. Why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? Has God abandoned his heavenly post? Is he completely oblivious to everything that's going on? Or even in our darkest of moments, does God hate me? One of the reasons that I want to preach through the book of Ruth and have you study the book of Ruth is because I believe the book of Ruth will help us to answer these questions both reasonably and God-honoringly. I believe if we can look at the scriptures, we can begin to look at our pain, begin to look at our affliction through the lens of biblical truth instead of the lens of our affliction. that we begin to look at the truth about who God is, what he is actually up to, and whether, in fact, he's good or not. But that's not the only reason that I want to look at the book of Ruth. I have six reasons here that I've put in your study guide that I believe we should, as a church, study the book of Ruth. Uh, The first being that the book of Ruth is about God and his purposeful sovereignty or providence. Though the book of Ruth is named after a Moabite woman living in Bethlehem, it's still, in fact, about much more than that. It's about... Yes, her mother-in-law, Naomi. It's about a noble man named Boaz. It's actually a book about God, too. It's a book about his purposeful sovereignty. Now, when I say purposeful sovereignty, I also mean providence, and we will get into that momentarily. But it's a story designed to help us see that all of life's sorrows and tragedies fall underneath the providential arm of God and that he is good and has a good purpose in it all regardless of how we might feel about our circumstances at any one given moment. Secondarily, the book of Ruth is God-breathed scripture. You can actually put this at number one. It is the most important, the most imperative reality here. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This means that everything contained in the canon of Scripture, your Bible, is infinitely important. It is absolutely beneficial. It is valuable and it is unshakably true. Nothing can be thrown away from these Scriptures without throwing out God's message. 
Nothing can be neglected in these scriptures if we are to actually be, as 2 Timothy 3 finishes, equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. So why should we study the book of Ruth? Because it's scripture. And scripture is God-breathed, and it is profitable for us in every single way. Thirdly, the book of Ruth is a beautiful love story. Who doesn't love a good love story? The book of Ruth is a very passionate love story where a noble man swoops in to reverse the misfortunes of a godly woman and call her his own. It is so heartwarming, in fact, that this book, the book of Ruth, has been studied, thought about, cherished, uh, and, 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 and theologized for thousands of years. It's been looked upon with smiles and excitement because it is such a great love story. But more than that, it is also a love story that points to an even bigger love story. It is a typological story that shows us the love story between God and his church. Where the great redeemer, the kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, gets a bride for himself, lovingly and nobly. Now, fourthly, the book of Ruth teaches us about biblical manhood and womanhood. You do not have to turn on the TV very long. You do not have to surf the internet very long before you realize that our culture has a fundamentally deranged misunderstanding of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. And we are going to see here in the book of Ruth a very sharp contrast. <laughs> It's going to help us see clearly that there are such things as men and there really are such things as women and that they are uniquely and purposely gifted by God to fulfill certain roles and behave in certain ways that glorify him and promote his good order. Fifthly, the book of Ruth is about families. It's true the book of Ruth promotes God's sovereign and providential rule over nations, epochs in history, and even the family lineages when you kind of get down into the nitty gritty. But it is also deeply concerned with the real life experience of a particular family living in the unpredictable and oftentimes unexpected winds of God's disorienting but perfectly executed plan. So we want to study Ruth because it's about families and, and how a family functions underneath the providential and sovereign arm of God. Sixthly and lastly, though certainly there could be more, the book of Ruth glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the reality is, and it's probably surprising to some of you because Jesus is actually not mentioned by name that the book of Ruth exists to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ by proving the reality that all of history from beginning to end, even in its bleakest and darkest of moments, exists to prepare the world to see the beauties, the glories, and the majesty of Jesus Christ. For instance, it's going to show us very clearly and very explicitly a thousand years before Christ even came to this earth that he would one day be the sole kinsman, redeemer of his people through the line of David. And so as we begin to study the book of Ruth, I want you to have all of this cemented in your mind as we look at our first passage which is going to be Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And in these verses, we are going to see that though we suffer, God's pur purposeful sovereignty or providence is always at work behind the scenes, working for the saints' ultimate good. And we are going to see that very explicitly by looking at a family here, living under God's judgment and discipline, we're also going to see in these verses a family living under God's providence. And then we're also going to see in these same verses a family that teaches you with their lives that God is writing your story as well. And so if you would, please stand with me for the honoring and reading of God's holy, infallible, 
an all-sufficient word. Ruth, chapter 1, starting in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Now it happened in the days when the judges judged that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the fields of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. Ephrathites of Bethlehem and Judah. Now they came to the fields of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Kilion also died, and the woman was left without her two children and her husband. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. As I mentioned in my introduction... The first thing that I want to examine is the reality that the book of Ruth is a story about a family living under God's judgment and discipline. If you look with me at, our, at verse 1, it begins this way. Now it happened in the days when the judges judged. This story begins not with a introduction of a time stamp so that we would know when the book of Ruth was written as it pertains to years. It's not trying to help us locate a moment in history uh, where Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz lived. Although using this piece of information, we can see that it was likely written during the time of David because David is mentioned at the end of the book somewhere around 1011 or 90, 971 B.C. But what's happening here is the writer of Ruth, potentially Samuel, is giving us a theological, theological description of the character of the time in which the story of Ruth took place. What do I mean by that? I mean what the author of Ruth is trying to do is to help us understand that it was a really bad time when some really good stuff happened. And the darkest time that Israel has ever had, that's when this story began to take place. In the time when the judges judged. Uh, when the judges judged, there were increased increasingly bits of debauchery there was violence there was uh, rebellion against the Lord as a matter of fact if you just turn one page back seriously just turn one page back if you look at judges uh, chapter 21 verse 25 it says in those days there was no king in Israel Everyone did was was did what was right in his own eyes. So when the judges judged, or when the judges ruled, or when the judges did the things that the judges did, there was no king in the world, and everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. Now, we're good reformed people here, right? And we know that apart from Christ, that we are all totally depraved. That evil is what we cherish. It's what we live for. It's what we sacrifice for. So could you imagine what it would look like in a society where there is no king and everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes? Well, it would look a little bit like America. So the setting here is one where we are reminded that God has been dealing with Israel in a very harsh way. The book of Judges is clouded with stories of Israel's rebellion. And then they would repent. And then they would go back to their sin. And then God would judge them again. 
until eventually the repentance actually meant nothing because they just relied on the reality that God uh, would come through. It's pretty telling then when Ruth goes out to gather the grain in the fields that Boaz owned, that Boaz has to put certain things in place so that she wouldn't be raped. All of these things begin to make sense when you realize that the story takes place in a place where there is no rule, only everybody doing what is right in their own eyes. It is the darkest time in Israel's history. But wait, it gets darker. Just when you could, didn't think it could get dark enough, there is more darkness to learn of. It says here, now it happened in the days of uh, when the judges judged that there was a famine in the land. So, in other words, in Israel's darkest season, there became more darkness in the form of a famine. That is, for those of you who don't know, uh, when all of the food and all of the crops dry up because there has no rain that has come and saturated the place with its goodness. And the question becomes, well, why was there a famine? Well, many of us might try to figure out the science behind why that might have happened or why the sun and the moon weren't in the right place at the right time. And I don't know, I'm a preacher. I'm not uh, one of those science guys. <laughs> and there might be some truth to the way in which God works things in the atmosphere to produce rain. I'm not saying that that is not the case, but there is oftentimes, especially in this case, a theological reason why rain did not fall on the land. And it is very true here. There was a famine in the land precisely because God is judging Israel for their rebellion. I want you to look with me at Deuteronomy chapter 28. In John, Ch Je Deuteronomy chapter 8, God promises to withhold rain and destroy people's livelihood if they do not keep his commandments and love him. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, it says, But it will be if you do not listen to the voice of Yahweh your God to keep and do all his commandments and his statutes which with, I, with which I am commanding you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And now God is going to literally walk through ridiculous amounts of curses and where those curses will fall. He picks up again in verse 23 and says, And the heaven which is over you and your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you iron. Yahweh will make the rain of your land powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. In other words, I'm going to send rain. It's not going to be rain. It's going to be dust. And it's going to kill everything until you're gone. And in verse 38, in verse 38 through 40, we see a little bit more of this picture. You shall bring out much seed to the field, but you will gather in little, for the locust will consume it. You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm will devour them. You shall have olive trees throughout your territory, but you will not anoint yourself with oil, for your olives will drop off. You see, not only was everyone doing what was right in their own eyes, which is judgment enough, according to Romans chapter 1, but then there's more judgment in that God has brought the famine to Israel that he promised to bring to them if they did not stop rebelling him, against him, rather. And then what do we have here? We have even more trouble. So here we've seen the setting. The setting is in Israel 
where everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, and there is a famine that is literally causing people to die and go hungry. Now let's look at this family's sinful sojourn. Look with me here again at our text. He continues on in verse 1. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the fields of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. Here in the story of Ruth, we are introduced to our main characters, although many of them will be gone by the time we get to verse 6. But what you see here is they decided to, seeing everything around them, especially the famine, to sinfully leave the land of promise that had been purchased for them in the time of Joshua to a place that they never should have gone in the first place. Elimelech here is the first example of what a godly man should not be. Boaz is going to be the example, as we look at this story, of what a true biblical man ought to look like, and he so mimics the type of love that Christ has for his bride that we should try to emulate that. Elimelech, on the other hand, is quite the opposite. Instead of looking around and saying that the crops were not growing, and then examining himself and asking his family to repent of their sin and to walk in the life that God had purchased for them, he desired to have his belly full instead. He saw that the promised land was dried up, which is pretty ironic because Bethlehem is, called, is named the house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means. It's supposed to be flowing with milk and honey, and yet God has removed all of this sustenance. Elimelech looks at that, and instead of him recognizing and examining his own heart and repenting of his sin, which is what God called them to do when that happened, he fled. He fled looking for material blessing. As I said, it is the ultimate irony that God would cause the house of bread to cease making things that would make bread. And instead of repenting, he took his family where they could fill their bellies and rather than repenting, they made a faithless decision to escape discipline. What God was doing there was, yes, judgment, but he was disciplining his people so that they would return back to him. And so what he did was he decided that instead of sitting underneath that discipline and growing from it, that he would flee towards comfort and security. And he felt as though that he would have more at home in the land of compromise than in the land of promise that God had given him. There was grass that was greener on the other side. Who cares what God has to say? There's something better over here. Children, would you look at me for just one second? If you do not, catch anything I'm saying for the rest of this sermon. Hear me say this, that where God calls you, no matter how hard that might be, that's better than any other place you could be. God's people are better to be around than people who reject God. God gives his blessing to his covenant children and covenant people when they honor his word and when they go where he says to go where they, uh, and, and where they stay, where he says to stay, and who they love when he tells them to love them. 
So not only did they sinfully sojourn, they sojourned to a specific place. It says in verse 1 here that they sojourn in the fields of Moab. Now to you, that might just be another place. To them, it seemingly was just another place. Remember, Abraham left when there was a famine and went to Egypt. They might, could have went to Egypt, but it's a little further uh, of a trip. If you look at the map that I put in the study guide, you will see it's just right over the Red Sea. Moab's right there, and they heard, obviously, by report of some kind, that there was some sort of food there. But Moab is a place that God has specifically told them, the Israelites, not to go. So now we have more rebellion. We have more sin entering into this sojourn. Deuteronomy 23.3 says, No Amorite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of Yahweh. Even to the tenth generation, none of their seed shall ever enter the assembly of Yahweh. Because they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt. And because they they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of the Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, Yahweh, your God, was not willing to listen to Balaam. But Yahweh, your God, turned the curse into a blessing for you because Yahweh, your God, loves you. You shall never seek their peace or their prosperity in all your days. They they were never supposed to surround themselves with Moabites. They were never supposed to go and be a part of their uh, cities. They were not supposed to go and share in their prosperity. That's what this text just says. Moabites were so disgusting to God because of their profane worship and idol lovingness that Psalm 68 says, Moab is my wash bowl. In other words... What God was saying about the Moabites because of the way in which they treated God's covenant people and because they worshiped foreign gods, that it's it's as if it's dirty water for him to wash his hands in after a long, hard day's work. They're filthy. They're nasty. And my covenant people, God says, are not to have anything to do with them. And yet Elimelech is leading his family there, knowing full well that he should not do that. Men, how many of you, because of ease and comfort, lead your family into ruin, into disobeying God? Because that is exactly what Elimelech is doing here. But not only that, it gets worse. There's more rebellion bound up in this sinful soldier. Yes, he sought their prosperity, the Moabites, that is, It gets deeper than that. Not only were they just nasty and dirty because of the ways in which they profaned God and his people, they also oppressed Israel. They actually stood over them. In Judges 3, 12 through 14, it says, The sons of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. So Yahweh strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done what was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. And he gathered to himself the sons of Ammon and Amalek. And he went and struck Israel, and they possessed the city of the palm trees. So the sons of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. So not only... I hope you're feeling the weight of this. (laughs) So not only did Elimelech lead his family into a situation that God never called him to, when he got there, he was bound up in their prosperity, eating their food. But he was also giving a thumbs up to the fact that they had oppressed Israel. It's pretty bad, but it gets worse. This is how bad of a father Elimelech was. He put his sons into a situation where they would then become tempted. It would logically follow then, if you are not to have anything to do with the Moabites because of their sinful rebellion against God and their hatred of God's people, that they are God's 
a wash bowl, that they were once oppressors of Israel, that you don't marry a Moabite women. Or women, you don't marry Moabite men. But it says here, look with me again. The names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem and Judah. Now they came to the fields of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons, and they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. I want you to notice that. They took for themselves Moabite wives. God never sanctioned such things. And let me say this. In the same way, this principle still applies. Christians are not to marry, pursue romantically, or have anything to do with in terms of relationship for a long term with anybody who does not follow Jesus. A Christian must never pursue a non-Christian romantically. Children, would you look at me one time? As you grow older, you're going to want a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife. And the Bible tells us that we are not to be unequally yoked. We are not to marry anyone who rejects the God that we love and worships whom we worship. And the reason for that is because they're going to cause us to want to worship other gods, to value different things than what God tells us to value. And that has disastrous effects. One of the things that God has against the Moabites is that they had women who seduced them as they were running through the wilderness. People will try to get you to like them even though they don't like Jesus, but you must remember that you have got to pursue men and be pursued by women, men who love Jesus. So they took pagan wives outside of the covenant community but here's another issue that they had. They lived life, this family, Elimelech being the head, with their physical eyeballs and not their spiritual eyeballs. In other words, they lived by sight and not by faith. And the Bible tells us that whatever is not done in faith is sin. Romans 14.23 says, whatever is not from faith is sin. So they did not trust in God to provide. They did not trust in God to re relent if they had repented of their sin. And they didn't even trust God to repent of the, enough to repent of their sin. And look, I understand they had all of these pressures mounting. <laughs> they needed to provide for their, and Elimelech needed to provide for his family. They needed to put food on their children's plate. And so they saw in front of them was an obstacle that needed to be attacked. But everything that we do, according to the word of God, must be done according to the word of God because the God of the word has said, this is the best way to do it. And we must live with our eyes to heaven, trusting him that he will carry us through because when we decide to make our own plans and do our own things, we wind up killing our whole family. You don't believe me? Let's look at our next point, which is the sufferings of Naomi. In verse 3, Naomi's whole life begins to explode. It says, Then Elimelech, Elimelech Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. I want you to see something here. I want you to see that God is 
through his servant who is writing the book of Ruth as trying to show us the very dark situation that exists that, that Ruth uh, and Naomi are, are a part of. They're a part of a city that is doing whatever, or a part of a nation that does whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, no matter uh, if it disgusts God or not. There's a famine in the land. Then it wants us to see that Elimelech has led his, his family literally into ruin. And then what is the next thing that happens? Elimelech dies. Now, commentators, when you read, are kind of split on whether or not Elimelech died because of judgment. Maybe he just died in some accident. Uh, maybe it had nothing to do with the fact that he was a horrible leader. And so, because the text doesn't explicitly say that Elimelech was killed in judgment, we're supposed to withhold from concluding such things. But I agree with the commentators that say, no, we're supposed to be following the story. Right? So there is a cause for why this happened. Elimelech has died because of the rebellion that he has, in fact, ensued in and brought his family in. Now, does God do that every single time? No. But he did it here. He did it here. We're supposed to be absolutely blown away by the reality that this is what happens when you disobey God and bring your family into the problem. God will judge you for it. To some, it might be death. To some, it might be the fact that your children grow up and hate Jesus. I mean, there's so many different things. If you are not vigilant as a father, vigilant as a leader, there are countless judgments that can fall upon you. For him, it was death. And for Naomi, it was death. It was just as much judgment on Naomi as it was for Elimelech. But don't worry. At least she's got two sons. It gets worse. They took for them, uh, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, verse 3, and she was left with her two sons. Psych, just kidding. Verse 4, they took for themselves Moabites' women as wives, the name of the one Orpah and the name of the other Ruth, and they lived there about 10 years. Then both Malon and Kilion also died, and the woman was left without her two children and her husband. So now... Not only has Elimelech died, but God has killed the rest of the men in the family. And just one sentence, kind of, if you put them together, Naomi's life, who is going to become our first main character, really, her entire life just explodes. It falls to pieces because of the rebellion that exists. She is suffering because of the rebellion that Elimelech has brought them into. And of course, she was a participant in. Naomi here now is left at the end of verse 5, homeless and helpless. There is judgment here because in the ancient times to not have a husband and to not have any men that were capable of working and bringing in food and killing animals was a death sentence. Which is why you're going to see later on that Ruth can even go and gather this grain in the fields. The law uh, in Israel was set up in such a way to protect the most vulnerable. And so they could walk around the outside, gather grain so that they could eat so they wouldn't die if they didn't have um, a husband or anybody like that to help them to get food and, and to get shelter and so on and so forth. And so Naomi is standing here. With their whole world crashing down around her because she's absolutely and utterly alone. Yes, she still has her two daughters-in-law, but at the end of the day, that's not going to really help that much on the grand scheme of things. God has brought judgment and suffering down on this family because of their sin. So we have a setting where God has judged Israel. 
Now we have a family that has been judged by God because they have decided to not trust the God of Israel and to make their own plans, to do their own thing, and to go where they might get their bellies full, regardless of whether or not their hearts are full. So Ruth is understandably going to be absolutely distraught. As a matter of fact, in just a few verses later, in Ruth 1, 20 through 21, she says, Do not call me Naomi. By the way, Naomi, there's a Hebrew play on words here that means pleasant. Do not call me Naomi. Do not call me pleasant, she says. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but Yahweh has caused me to return empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Why do you call me pleasant? Yahweh has answer, uh, answered against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity against me. What sobering and real words. That's, that's not a Sunday school answer. That's not a how you doing today. Oh, highly favored and incredibly blessed. My life sucks. And God has completely just given me the stone cold Steve Austin. Like it is done. Some of you do not understand what that was. But that's okay. But the story is not just about a family who experiences suffering and judgment. It's also a story about a family living under God's providence, like I said. We needed to look at the bad news because it is the backdrop that helps us to understand the redemption to come. This example is used quite often, but if you ever go to a store to buy diamonds, for example, they will usually bring out a black velvet cloth, and they will take a diamond, and they will put it in front of this black cloth. And the reason that they do that is so that you can actually see the beauty of the diamond that would otherwise be marred if they were just to leave it on a, another surface. The black helps you see the the clarity of the diamond, the size of the diamond, the beauty and the sparkle of the diamond. And had that velvet black drop not been there, you probably wouldn't have bought it. Well, what separates this diamond from this diamond? And so here we have this black backdrop that shows us that God is about to interject himself into a seemingly hopeless situation and completely redeem it, thus showing us the reality of our redemption in Christ Jesus. And so this book is about, yes, it is certainly about a family living under God's judgment and suffering, but it is also a book about a family living under God's purposeful sovereignty. So what is God's providence or his purposeful sovereignty? And why does it matter? And why is this book so consumed with teaching him? Well, in order to understand providence, we must first understand sovereignty. Sovereignty. Now, we've been preaching at other times through the book of Ephesians, and so I hope that sovereignty is a buzzword that catches your attention and you can kind of put some kind of definition to but if you can't, I will go ahead and tell you that it is a theological buzzword that essentially means God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. God is completely and utterly sovereign. There's nothing you can do, there's nothing I can do to thwart any sort of plan that he has. He is all-powerful, and he is all-wise, and he is all-everything, and he will accomplish that which he has set his mind and his heart to accomplish. Creation didn't exist. He made it exist <laughs> right people were rebelling against him he changes their hearts like God can do anything and nothing is too hard for him but being sovereign doesn't change anything it's just the ability to change things providence on the other hand is the handmaiden if you will to sovereignty 
providence is God perfectly governing all things in order to fulfill his purpose. Or as one theologian has put it, which I like, which is why I stuck it in the study guide, which is why I use it here now, is this idea of purposeful sovereignty. It is purpose behind his power. Sovereignty is God's ability to accomplish anything he wants, and providence is his aiming at his creatures to achieve his purposes, namely the glorifying of his son and the saving of sinners. And that doesn't always mean that it's good. Its end is good, but everything that we experience up until that point of goodness might look bad. Not everything at every moment is rainbows and unicorns. God is going to do really amazing things in this family, for this family, and ultimately for the rest of humanity through this family, but he did it through darkness. He did it through blood. He did it through tears. He did it through hard trials, and he will do the same for us. When we say that God is providential... We're saying that he is using all things to accomplish his pur purpose. So let's not get this confused because I think we do often in the church get this confused. If we get cancer and it's healed, wow, God's providence. If we get cancer and we die, it's still providence. God is working in and through everyone. And the fact that so many people died in this first chapter should sh show us that God is not here to make sure that everybody doesn't experience harm. We brought harm into this world. We will experience harm, and he will use that harm for his good pleasure. Acts 2 comes to mind. God used the acts of sinful men to crucify the Lord Jesus, which is the best thing that could have happened in the history of the world. Because God is sovereign, and he providentially and purposely works in all things. But specifically in regard to this text, he's working to bring about the kinsman redeemer, Boaz, but more than that, Jesus Christ, who will be the perfect picture that Boaz could never be. And we see hints of this providential working even here in verse 2. Go back with me to verse 2. It says, The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Ephrathite. Does that ring a bell to anyone here in this room? But should, it's talked about every single Christmas. There's a prophecy in Micah chapter 2 that the book of Matthew picks up on. And it says, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be a ruler of Israel. His goings forth are from everlasting, from the ancient of days. Did you know that there is so much theology in just five verses? There's a hint already at the beginning of this book that there's something better coming than Boaz. There's something better coming than this story has to offer in and of itself. But it gets deeper than that. He's providentially working even in this darkness all the way through this story to when you get to the end of the book of Ruth in chapter 4. If you look at chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, it ends with a genealogy. Now these, it says, are the generations of Perez. Perez became the father of Hezron, and Hezron became the father of Ram, and Ram became the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab became the father of Nashon, and Nashon became the father of Salma, and Salmon became the father of Boaz, and Boaz became the father of Obed, and Obed became the father of Jesse, and Jesse became the father of David. Who's David? King David. 
So God providentially worked. I want you to see this. God providentially worked in the lives of this family in such a way that though his people rebelled against him and though they hate him, hated him and though Elimelech was a poor and horrible excuse for a father and a leader, he worked in and through them so much so that Ruth, a Moabite woman who is considered by the Israelites and by God at that time to be complete and utter trash, brings her into the family that would then one day bring forth the Messiah to save the world and to be the kinsman redeemer of all time. What an amazing God that works providentially and purposefully. Wow. That's the end of the story, but it's really also the beginning of the story. And what this should teach us is that God controls every channel of water, water, every living creature, every family line, every moment of every single part of history. I said this to somebody on the phone the other day. We were talking about something. They had a question uh, from the, because they were having a theological conversation uh, with somebody. And I said to him, God knows the future because he creates the future. He's completely sovereign, but he's completely provident. He, he works it out so purposefully and providentially that everything matters. Every little insignificant thing in your life matters, and this is what it teaches us. Does that frighten you? Does that, does that frighten you? It shouldn't. It shouldn't frighten you. But many people are oftentimes frightened by or they even reject God because, or they even reject Reformed theology because God should not have that much liberty to do with our lives as he wills. But I want to say to you, before we start digging deeper into this book that that kind of an understanding or disposition really stems from three really big problems. The first one being, you aren't as deserving as you think you are to run your own life. <laughs> when we look at that and say, well, God shouldn't have that much liberty, who, liberty to do with us as he sees fit. Who are you, O man? Paul says in Romans chapter 8. The only thing that we deserve because of our rebellion is that, what, is that which Elimelech and his sons got. Death and the grave and hell and eternal punishment. That we shouldn't be so absorbed with ourselves to think that we should be able to run our entire lives. We need to go where God tells us to go, see who he says to see, and behave how he tells us to behave. The second wrong disposition is that we misunderstand that God is more deserving than you think he is to run our life. <laughs> Not only are we less deserving, but he is more deserving. God is holier. He is more helpful. He is more powerful. He is more good than we will ever be. And anything that he tells us to do, he tells us to do it because he loves us. And because he knows how the engine works. When I have a problem with my engine, I call Chris or I call Justice. Why? Because they know how engines work and I do not. God knows how we operate. He created us and he knows what's best for us. So we need to trust his providence. Three, we also have a deficient understanding that God lovingly condescended and slaughtered his son that you might have life. And so if it freaks you out, the idea that God has so much power that he providentially works in his sovereignty, know this. He's a good God who sent his son to live the life that we could not live and to die the death that we deserve to die so that he might ascend and be our high priest forever and the king of our lives. So we have seen thus far that the book of Ruth is a story about a family under God's judgment and discipline. We have seen that they have sinfully sojourned and experienced the sufferings that come along with sinning against a holy God. We've also seen that 
The book of Ruth is a story about a family under God's purposeful sovereignty that he's carrying out this great redemptive plan through no matter how dark it might look. And lastly, I want you to see that the book of Ruth is a story about a family that teaches you with their lives that God is writing your story as well. The sober and stunning re, uh, truth is that your life, whether you know it or not, is full of judgment, suffering, and providence, even if you don't see it. Our story is bound up in this story, and God is continuing to write for us our story. Much like Elimelech, Malon, and Kilion, we deserve death. We are under the judgment of God. We stand, as a matter of fact, in the path of the wrath of God. All of us, apart from Christ, deserve nothing, as I said, but hell and damnation. And yet, providentially, God has worked in your life, saint, to bring about the gift of eternal life. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is, an eternal, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so this story here is written to show us that we ought not despair, but have hope in the God who has lifted us from judgment and has given us the gift that only he can give, given us eternal life. And look, I want you to see here, there are people who died. So it also teaches us, much like their story, that we ought not neglect or abuse the grace of God. We ought to look at the fact that God has brought us from the precipice of hell, given us eternal life, not let judgment be our story, but given us a new one, and look around and say, that's not everybody's story. God is so gracious and lovingly, loving to give me such a beautiful and amazing gift. These people did not receive, by these people I mean Elimelech and his two sons, they did not receive the loving kindness of God. They received the wrath of God. But if you are in Christ, you will never taste the wrath of God. Secondarily, uh, another way that this story proves to us that our story is still being written by God himself is that you too, like Naomi, are disciplined to share in Christ's holiness by our Heavenly Father. You see, Naomi and her family sinned by rebelling against God. And sin brings pain. And pain requires, not pain, but sin requires discipline. For those whom God loves, he disciplines. If you turn with me, for example, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. It says this in verse 5. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he flogs every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall, not, shall we not much more rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? Every single one of God's children will be disciplined. Every one of them will be scourged. And if they are not, if you are not, then you should ask the question, am I really a child of God? Because he will not live his children in sin and rebellion. He will pull them out. He does have a long wick, but there will come a day when he will move and act on behalf of his glory and his son, and you're good. He will do it. He will come through. The question you have to ask yourself is how broken will your bones get before you get there? 
Will you listen now or will you wind up running your family, running yourself into absolute ruin? In Psalm 5, David is caught up in this sin uh, with Bathsheba. And he gets found out and he repents of this sin. And he says, let the bones that you have, been, that you have broken rejoice. Discipline is a good thing from a good father. And lastly, though your sins were as scarlet and your chains were many, because of your Redeemer, you are secure, safe, and situated in the loving arms of God. That's your story. Ephesians 1, 8, uh, 1 7 says, In him we have redemption, a huge buzzword here for this book. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions, according to the riches of his grace. We have a redeemer, much like Boaz. Like one who will redeem this family who so obviously needs redeemed from their situation. Thomas Boston, a Puritan, says it like this. In our redemption by Christ, we have the fullest, clearest, and most delightful manifestation of the glory of God that ever was or ever shall be in this life. All the declarations and manifestations that we have of his glory in the works of creation and common providence are but dim and obscure in comparison with what is here. Indeed, the glory of his wisdom, power, and goodness is clearly manifested in the work of creation, but the glory of his mercy and love had lain under an eternal eclipse without a redeemer. In other words... If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus Christ came and redeemed his people, every good thing that he has ever done would be buried for us. And he awakens our senses, gives us eyes to see him, hearts to love him, hands to work for him, and so on and so forth. And so how do we use the truths that we have been given in the text thus far? I have for you six uses in closing, and I will try to make them brief. One. The first use here. Remember, things are never better where God has not called you. Things are never better where God has not called you. You see, Elimelech, Ruth, Malon, and Kilion all abandoned God's commandments because they thought this will be better for us. And on paper, it looked perfect, right? Right? They had a place where they could live. They had food. The place where they're at had no food. When you put it in your little, you know, chart of risk-reward kind of a thing, it was the perfect move. But because God had not called them to be there, it was a horrible situation for them. Everyone almost dies. Number two, remember... Children and the unmarried among us. God has not given you permission to romantically pursue, date, or marry godless men and women because you're lonely or they're right in front of you. That is proximity. (laughs) Just because you're lonely, just because there might be somebody in your midst that you enjoy talking to does not mean that you should pursue them because they don't love Jesus. They don't value the things that you value. And they will not want to raise your children the way that you want to raise your children. Thirdly, remember, discipline is not punishment from a cruel and distant deity, but the loving act of a father that adores you. And he does it so that you will return to him. Discipline exists not to just show you that you messed up, but to bring you back to him. To bring you back to him, to share in Christ's holiness so that you could be one and have communion with your father. As we will see, Ruth is going to go back to the promised land and she is going to follow her God. She listened when she was disciplined. Will you? Number four, and this is a huge one that I hope that you take seriously. The book of Ruth shows us that sin has real life consequences. 
It is absolutely and utterly true that God forgives every single sin, which is actually my next point. That Romans 8 says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what the cross did for you, saint. But that doesn't mean that there's not consequences for your sin. If you live according to the father of lies, if you live making sinful, immature, and idiotic decisions, you will reap what you sow. Sometimes God is gracious, and sometimes he steps in the gap so that doesn't happen. But more often than not, your sin follows you. And so remember that when you read the book of Ruth. Fifthly, remember, uh, no matter what sins you've committed or what discipline you've endured or are currently enduring, God is still working all things for your good. What you'll see here is Naomi and Ruth, though they are going to go through some very hard trials, though they've been through some hard trials already that we've seen, God is still working in all of that mess to bring about a really great situation wherein the entire family is redeemed. This truth is echoed very clearly in the New American Standard 95. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Because of the redemption found in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forever and freely forgiven. There is nothing you can do that will undo the work, of, the work of Christ on the cross. And as far as discipline goes, God is not seeking to wound you, but to woo and win you back to himself. That's the truth found in the book of Ruth. Sixthly and lastly, remember, no matter how dark and bleak things look around you, you have a redeemer that lives. It's interesting Naomi is going to utter these words here at the beginning of Ruth where she talks about how the Lord has essentially crushed her. And then she's going to have some words said to her at the very end of Ruth. Ruth 4, 14 through 15. Blessed is Yahweh who has not left you without a kinsman redeemer today. And may his name be proclaimed in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of your soul and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. In other words, Ruth says to Naomi, I know things have hurt. I know you've been ground to dust but a redeemer lives a kinsman redeemer is here and his name will be proclaimed throughout all Israel may Yahweh also be to you a restorer of your soul and sustainer of your old age God has brought about a wonderful miracle in the lives of this family and what's interesting is, though she's speaking about Boaz here, she's also really speaking about the Lord Jesus. She was talking about the Christ who would be born of her family line and who would pursue and redeem you and I. The great kinsman redeemer of the book of Ruth is not just Boaz, it is Christ who has come to redeem his people. From sin, bondage, and the like. In closing, I want to ask you this. To those of you who do not know the Lord Jesus, everything I have said up to this point, outside of providence, is for you. So is God providentially pursuing you right now by the hearing of the gospel of Jesus Christ? You are not in this seat for any other reason than to hear the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel proclaimed to you today. Maybe he is desiring to redeem you from the pit this very day. 
Maybe he has worked in such a way to make sure that you are here for a very specific reason, namely to fall in adoration of this great God who works through history and works through nations and works through families and will work through our poor efforts to make much of his name. So will you repent of your sin today and remember that though times may be dark, we can echo with the one who wrote God moves in mysterious ways when he says behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Will you pray with me?